unrequited love, hellish torment, a fight for survival, and a terminal devotion for early console gaming, the characteristics of a battle-hardened otherworldly traveler flung forth from their native world and subject to a tempestuous alien one. Today, I bring you Uncle from Another World, an anime which contains just that. Ah, uh, it took me three days to write that intro. Anyway, come on and slam, and welcome to Japan. We got pedestrians, we got crosswalks, we got big vehicles who don't look where they're going. This guy visits his uncle, who, 17 years ago, was struck by truck coon and entered a coma, and now has awoken. They exchange eye contact. The uncle decides to lighten the mood by speaking gibberish. There's an awkward silence, but he recovers by speaking Japanese, apologizing for being incomprehensible, and explains that he just returned from Grand Bahamal. This is the response. He flirts with a nurse in Grand Bahamalese and receives an armpit ornament. Back to business. The young un is named Takafumi, who is the only remnant of their broken family, which collapsed after Oji-san's lengthy moratorium. Oji scribbles this down in a notebook quickly, adds a mark, then recites a wizardly incantation. Back to business for real now. Our protagonist must prove that he was trapped in another world for 17 years, but his spells do not take effect. Takafumer is exasperated and begins to explain the hard reality of working part-time in a collapsing economy. The magic happens though. He is shook. Seems like Japanese is what works here. Takafumi instantly conjures fantastical images, then tears up some important looking papers. Oji-san continues to bewilder his nephew, but seems mostly interested in the console wars of the mid-90s. Takafumi relays the current situation. Oji-san's beloved Sega was bitterly defeated, and so the notebook ritual is conducted once more. Takafumi inquires about this Ikaris Kuara spell, which is revealed to erase memories, particularly ones that are unbearable. Oji-san offers up his book to be assessed an example. This this kills the man. Takafumi begs for his memory to be undone, and so the story begins, with the nephew attempting to make money off of his otherworldly uncle's wizard powers. Later, at HQ, Oji-san finds that 17 years has birthed the innovation and change of many aspects of everyday living, then expresses his admiration for his nephew, who has managed to socialize some. Takafumi asks about his uncle's comrades from the other world, but he basically just played solo. Takafumi is a little disappointed, but later, Oji-san rambles about Grand Bahamal. Apparently, the denizens of that world are very attractive. By comparison, Oji-san figures he must have looked grotesque since they hunted him down as an orc variant. This news is almost too much for the young Takafumi to hear, but Oji-san continues to speak of the constant harassment, specifically mentioning a woman he saved who exhibited some extremely tsundere characteristics. Unfortunately for Uncle, the concept of tsundere hadn't existed until recently. Takafumi realizes this and perishes in internally. Oji-san's life never went well in the other world, but now he's back and making terrible videos on the internet. Huh. He scrolls through the comments, who tear his beautiful creation to shreds. The pressure is almost too much to bear, as the internet slang causes Oji-san to crumble. He wants to purchase this cool new phone, but it can only use 2G and can't make calls. However, one who chooses the Sega console cannot live an ordinary life, which is enough reason, I suppose. They discuss the numerous features of smartphones while browsing the market. The talk of technological innovation reminds Oji-san that he made revolutionary strides in his other world. He figures that just showing Takafumi would be easier than explaining, and uses a variation of the memory spell to project his memories directly. Oji-san utilized rectangle magic to science together an infinite wellspring of water for a drought-stricken village. They didn't appreciate this, attempted to hang him, and smashed the magic water vase to pieces. The tsundere girl came to rescue Oji-san though. Wait, he got himself out. Takafumi is upset by this. Oji-san notices and offers a different camera angle to cheer him up, which gives Takufom the idea to see what the girl was up to. She sundares super hard. Takafumi is in awe of her kindness and beauty, while Oji-san reflects on being insulted constantly. Suddenly, the auction for Oji-san's cool phone is about to end. In a blind panic, he places a bid, only to find out that the shipping cost is 125% of the price of the phone. There is only one option which remains. They must pick it up in person. And so Oji-san jumps out the window to do just that. A few minutes later, phone is acquired, and Takafumi has managed 
manifested a cunning plan to save money on purchases. Later, to open a freshly delivered package of rice, Oji-san offers a cutting tool for Takafumi to use. It's a legendary grade weapon of mass destruction taken from his dimensional storage, of which he carries around many such items. Of course, as one might do, he attempted to sell a few pieces, but was only offered pennies from the local pawn shop. Takafumi asks whether these rings were meant as gifts, but Oji-san obtained them passively through dungeons. There is a pause. Oji-san figures that his nephew wishes to talk about relationships, and offers his 30 years of experience on the subject. His first love, all the way back in grade school, Sonic and Tails, he Sega nerds out in his memories, is actually extremely depressing. Takafumi reflects on this, then asks about girls in the other world, and so Oji-san shows him saving a gaggle of innocent civilians from a vicious looking pig man. They are grateful, or not. It seems they are even more afraid for their lives now. The woman melancholically accepts her subservience in exchange for the little one's lives, presumably. Takafumi is exasperated. Oji-san reflects on how afterwards he was knocked unconscious and tossed off a cliff somehow. Takafumi sees something he shouldn't have, then Oji-san rambles about how how she saved him after his fall. It is Elf, who Sunday Ray is harder than ever before. Oji-san doesn't want to be indebted to her, so he presents her with a legendary Cosmite ring, one of seven in existence. He goes ahead and forces it on her, not understanding the situation at all. Takafumi is fully aware, however. He attempts to subtly hint that his uncle just got married, but Ji-san accompanied his Elf babe to a local pawn shop to exchange the ring for money, and so she followed him around ever since. They stow away the items and come up with a new video idea. It's rainy. Our boys are struggling to increase their YouTube views and discuss business as a result. Oji-san reveals his latest package, a magazine revealing the content of a mid-90s Reader's Choice Sega Games ranking, the contents of which perhaps helped maintain his desire to live through the hardships thrown at him in the other world. Takafumi doesn't care. There is suspense. Oji-san reads the result. It isn't what he expected, but he plays it cool. I guess it actually isn't okay, and Oji-san dramatically moistens in the rain. He creates a localized thunderstorm while expressing his true feelings. Takafumi watches on in bewilderment. Later, they discuss RPG games, which reminds Oji-san of a circumstance from the other world. After defeating a village elder in Mortal Kombat, he was tasked with rousing a local bum whose family has looked after a special freezing sword with the power to slay the blaze dragon who has been giving them trouble recently. Here she is, Mabel, not the dragon, who is too depressed to leave her igloo. She wants to view a specific flower blossom, which is when Oji-san decided to head straight to the Shrine of Flame to slay the Blaze Dragon. Takafumi is furious at his efficiency. Later, he returned victorious to the Frosty Cave and Village Elder, who was thankful but conflicted. Suddenly, a package. Sega Saturn, and some games. It was meant as a surprise, but Tepis Fumes is hesitant due to their monetary constraints. Oji-san is given the gift of life. He makes the face of surprise. The Saturn came with a guardian heroes. Oji-san couldn't be more elated, and they play. It's New Year's Eve in Japan. However, the vibes in Grand Habebelamat are different on New Year's. Takafumi is limitlessly curious. When they get home, Oji-san shows him the otherworldly festival, fraught with merriment. Oji-san, by contrast, stayed far away from it all and went to bed early. Takafumi is limitlessly disappointed. There is tension, and more tension. They decide to do some gaming instead. Oji-san remembers that Mabel actually showed up at some point, and Takafumi Takafumi's with rage. And so the story continues. Mabel wants to be strong like Oji-san, and requests advice on combating cowardice. He tells her to live how she wants, which was pretty inspiring for her. Takafumi reflects on his uncle's steely cold MC vibes. However, in the memory, he he activates Mabel's sinister Hikikimori side with his Sega wisdom. She went on to offer him her sword, which Oji-san declined, and that was it. Takafumi goes to make noodles. They discuss the ending and cancellations of various shows which used to air 17 years ago. While partaking in the soba, sometime in the new year, a girl named Fujimiya encounters Oji-san being a schizophrenic in the park and decides to never walk this way again, then runs into Takafumi. They know each other. It's been a while, but they catch up briefly. Takafumi and invites her to his place to hang out some more. And so Fiji shows up, gets the go-ahead to enter, then walks around. She finds his sus hair as Oji-san emerges from the balcony. There is tension. He begins to cast his wizard spells on the intruder and makes a break for her to erase her memories. Takafumi interrupts, but Oji-san is tenacious, especially so. But she is a friend, all is well, more or less. She gets the gist of the situation, which she finds particularly insane. They refuse to display Ji-san's magic for free, which makes sense professionally. But 
causes Jumbiba to express concern over Takafumi's finances. Oji-san blurts out that she must like the boy. It's so true. But Takafumi has inherited Oji-san's neutron star-like density, and the conversation drifts towards Evangelion instead. If Oji-san is familiar with that, then he might catch up with the concept of Sundere shortly. Takabaka fears this result. A moment later, he reveals plainly that he has absolutely no potential for finding that ending, which Takafumi reflects on. Fujimiya moves the conversation along, but Oji-san sticks to the topic of true love by uttering the hushed name Kaid Nanase, then monologues about her tragic story with a single tear escaping from beneath his glasses. Fuji is inspired, but Takafumi understands that his uncle's wisdom is sourced only from Sega and tells her. She is shook, goes to scold him, but in a flash is teleported behind and gets her mind read. The truth of her visit is laid bare. Takafumi is too dense to understand though. Suddenly, a package arrives and Oji-san goes to investigate. Fujimiya trails him with fury, inquiring on his identity. Oji-san responds by stating he's an uncle, back from another, but there is a package. Fuji takes the opportunity to tell Taka to get out of here, insisting that she can help him escape monetarily. This only causes Takafumi to invite her to be a roommate. She is shook. The package is 50 pounds of rice, which causes the delivery boy in Fujimiya to steam aggressively. Takafumi returns home one day to find an elf fondling Fujit. Sometime in the past, uncle is delighted with Fujimiya's presence when they are presented with the 2018 changes in the YouTube partnership program, meaning that Oji-san was no longer eligible for monetization. It is a dark day. Oji-san's got more subos than I do, but still needs a couple hundred more to get that advertising cash flow. He seems to have trouble adapting to internet etiquette and governs his comment section with an iron fist. Takafumi intervenes, but the situation remains the same, reminding Oji-san of the time when the sealed city, Luvaldrum, was besieged by a thousand legendary beasts. Takafumi is infinitely interested, and they get to the viewing. Oji-san ponders the reason for erecting such a large barrier. When his elven mega babe shows up to insult him for looking like an orc, this causes unnecessary attention from the civilians, but all is repaired. She follows Oji-san through the city, questioning why he doesn't hide his face, pestering him about the origination of this large fruit, and educating him about the importance of a barrier of this size, protecting Lavaldrum from powerful monsters. Oji-san doesn't pay attention, and absolutely obliterates the ancient shield just to see if he could do it. Takafumi is exasperated. The beasts arrive, attack on Titan style. The reference is uncanny. There is also a dragon. The plebs are shook, but Elf and Oji-san find a vantage point to prepare for a counterattack. Mass casualties cannot be prevented with so many monsters, but Elf readies her epic sci-fi fantasy blade, primed to engage in heroism. She calls Oji-san an awkward baka, tells him to run, then gallantly propels herself towards the hellish onslaught and straight into a barrier that Oji-san asked the spirits to put up. The day was saved as the plebs mutter in joint confusion. Elf shows up to give them some reassurance and goes to check on Orcface, who questions why she didn't snitch on him. She asks for dinner as payment, but to prevent immediate extortion, Oji-san fled the city. The moral of his anecdote reveals itself in the form of simply asking for what you want. In this case, it would be subscribers, so Oji-san does just that. Takafumi doubts the efficacy of this tactic, but it's a proven strategy for gaining subscribers. It actually works. <coughs> He is shook. Fuji shows up to find them in the middle of this conflict and attempts to convince Oji-san that YouTube is not an actual job. She fails miserably after accidentally carrying the conversation back to her potentially becoming a roommate. Takafumi isn't so sure about having two dudes share a room and pieces out to do some shopping. Oji-san empathizes with Fujimiya's lack of riz and offers his assistance. This means less than nothing to her though. Oji-san is shook and goes to sulk. She kind of regrets being rough and goes to talk. Finding Oji-san has metamorphosed into Obasan. Fuji hasn't witnessed Oji-san's magic yet and isn't able to evaluate the situation. Oji-san covers for himself using wind magic to recreate his man voice, then goes to immediately do girl talk with Fuji, who is experiencing boundless confusion. And here we are, back around full circle. There is tension, followed by suspense. Elf insists she isn't Oji-san, until Takfumi mentions Sonic and Tails, which swiftly reveals his aunt's true form, stating that 
transformation magic is forbidden unless absolutely necessary, which means he determined that girl talk was essential. Takafumi, an avid opportunist, snatches a chance to acquire additional YouTube views by tricking Oji-san into playing guardian heroes as a hot woman. Fujimiya has progressed beyond boundless confusion and has entered the dimensional plane of bamboozlement. They get set up, but the girl talk with Fuji must come first. Oji-san opens her memories to observe why Takafumi only sees her as a friend. Fujil still hasn't come to accept the existence of magic, but they continue. Here she is, being a crass bully. Fujimiya has a shocking revelation. Their bittersweet childhood memories were not exactly as she remembers, but Takafumi doesn't seem to mind. He recognized her in the streets because he saw the same girl who protected him. Despite outward appearances, Oji-san reflects on the Shrek plotline, starting to connect the dots between his relationship with Oba-san Elf, but ultimately figures that the transfiguration magic is beginning to have an effect on him and dismisses the thought. The latest video has commenced the public viewing. It's VTuber Elf Oji-san playing guardian heroes in a sexy woman's body. There is no gameplay footage. Oji-san is shocked to see his video reach 200,000 views, but Takafumi celebrates. Oji-san reads a single comment, no need for a console, and metamorphoses back into his true self, devoid of his pride as a YouTuber. Fujimiya is shook. Later, they partake in a lavish sashimi dinner with the success money. Takafumi is bullied by the local punks for reading fantasy light novels like a nerd. Unfortunately for the aggressors, Fujimiya is the bigger fish in this pond and eats them alive. Takafumi is elated by this result, impressed with Fuji's heroism. Back in the present, the same rings true. Fuji mitochondria responds by whipping out a middle school picture of her and Takafumi to prove that she evolved into a woman. Oji-san furiously takes a million pictures excited to capture the visage of his nephew as a youth. Fuji attempts to streamline efficiency by suggesting email or text instead, but Oji-san's phone simply doesn't do that. Instead, he was considering his primary method of long-distance communication be smoke signals or flags. Anyway, the coffee is superb. Oji-san purchased a coffee maker for Taka's 20th birthday gift, which causes Fiji to ideate on gifts as well. Deciding rather quickly to send him a lascivious middle school picture of which Takafumi decides to instantly delete due to social concerns. Ah, a sale of coffee beans, time to hastily flee. Her seduction technique lost to a sale advertisement for coffee beans. In a fit of rage, Fujimiya slaps a table, causing Oji-san's scalding coffee to buckle under her sheer power. As a result, Oji-san quickly unleashes a blast of frost magic to prevent injury. Injury was not prevented exactly, however, and after some brief defrosting, the moistened Fujirt must now take a shower. Oji-san fled the house to temporarily from guilt, and set her up with some of Takafumi's clothes. She equips his stuff, pondering the romanticism of it. Suddenly, Takafumarino returns home and infiltrates the shower. Expecting to find Oji-san, there is an infinite amount of sexual tension, and Takafumi skedaddles with a fervent apology. Fujimiya contemplates the situation and decides now is the time. She steals herself and enters his goon cave, finding him attempting to cast Icarus Kuara to purge the primal feeling of lust. He apologizes for being an accidental perv lord, but Fuji is cool with it. She even neglected to put on pants, homie. Taka cries a tear of regret as he states plainly that he will take responsibility. The emergency flag has been set, and Oji-san arrives to engage with the danger in response. Takafumi relays the situation and insists that his memory be erased. Fujimiya doesn't want this, however, but Takafumi has inherited the family's resilient antinatalistic genetics. He reflects on how blessed he is to have such a caring friend. Sometime later, Fujimipo has turned 20 as well, and Oji-san wishes to bequeath a gift, the wisdom of his personal philosophy. A pinch is a chance. The youngins are shook at his sudden prudence, as he explains that when faced with great adversity, simply changing your focus can turn things around. They are both thankful for the advice, and as an additional gift, Oji-san shows them the first time he drank alcohol. He hasn't aged since then, which the Takafuji reflect on briefly. Elf is wearing a sheer dress, which understandably attracts attention. Fujimiya is informed about the Sundere elf stalker. Back in the memory, Elf questions Oji-san about his abrupt recreation of a god-level barrier and receives a meatball as a bribe to not snitch on him for shattering the first one. She skips over the misunderstanding, asking how Orcface got to be so strong, reflecting on when they first met. Memory inception sequence activate. He exploded a massive worm, saving Elf from certain death. Apparently, this was the legendary Venom Dragon, which Oji-san didn't even know about. Elf 
berates him for this, but lets it go after Orkface states that he just wanted to save her. She soon to raise the question of whether he does this to seduce other women too, of which he unveils that he slew the blaze dragon, and Mabel was rather thankful afterwards. Elf is shook. The blaze dragon can only be defeated with a frozen blade, but Orkface somehow did it without. He reveals that after challenging it several times and observing its moves, the dragon was able to be slain with a regular sword. Elf is belligerent, but Ojisan counters by stating plainly that the people of this world simply gave up from the start, and confiding his motto upon her, a pinch is a chance. A saying which came from Puyo Puyo's strategy book, Fujifumi is exasperated, and Ojisan goes to fulfill his hankering to play Puyo Puyo. The memory continues on, as Orkface offers to take Elf back to his place. She sunderays, but he pulls her along with maximum Giga Chad Riz. Ojisan attempts to get them to play, but is quickly bribed into leaving the room with a single player game. Orkface stumbles along with Elf by his side, stating that he's glad she's here for when things get rough. There is sexual tension. Before making it to the room, Elf exclaims that she has no choice but to help him forever. It's all good now though, because Ojisan was just too drunk to navigate back to the inn. This kills the elf and the kids. Ojisan barges in to skip till morning, where Elf greets him, face still red from a night of crying. Ojisan doesn't notice, but Fujimiya felt that with her entire soul essence and pounds one down. Takafumi dies, and Ojisan consumes a fifth of a hard lemonade. This immediately cripples him, and Fuji begins to leave. Takafumi wants her to take responsibility, but she doesn't have another option otherwise. Ojisan wishes to use his magic to take her home, and ends up with the three of them spiraling through the sky. It's clear at this point that Ojisan can't hold his liquor. In the after credits, in some dungeon, Elf gets the poison centrally sucked out of her ear, but it was an aphrodisiac or something. Ojisan doesn't understand at all, and only makes her more aroused. She apologizes and incapacitates Orkface with a sharp knee to the face, after which she uses her magical headband to disable viewing of memories before definitely cons being Ojisan. Fujimiya asks Ojisan for some poison for Takafumi, but is misunderstood, and that's the end of part one of Uncle from Another World. Hey. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, like, comment, subscribe, or even sign up to my Patreon to feed me delicious pellets. Uh, thanks again. Bye.